Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heart of the Matter. I am your host, Elizabeth Vargas. I think everyone can agree on the power of music. It can be an incredible inspiration for people, a way for people to connect, a way for those of us all over the world, all ages, races, creeds, to really feel similar thoughts and emotions when we hear a song. And Partnership and Addiction, when we started a new campaign this past fall, a campaign about connection, especially important at the time of a pandemic when so many people are having a hard time connecting, uh, we used a song from the amazingly talented band, The Lumineers, called Salt and Sea. It's part of an album called Three from The Lumineers, um, and the entire album is dedicated to addiction and to recovery and to how the disease of addiction and the incredible lasting impact um, of that disease can spread throughout an entire family, often through generations of a family. It is an amazingly powerful album. There's a whole set of music videos that are actually strung together and form a movie of sorts that is tells the story of a family. Uh, all from three. And it's a really powerful thing to watch if you get a chance to watch it. Anyway, I had a chance to talk to Jeremiah Freights, who is one of the two leading band members for the Lumineers, the Grammy nominated band. They've got huge international hits like Ho oh Hey and Stubborn Love. Um, but they have a following all over the place and also have deep personal connections to the issue of addiction. Jeremiah lost his brother, Josh, to a heroin overdose when he was a teenager. Jeremiah himself is sober. And today on our podcast, we talk to Jeremiah about this extraordinary album, Three, about the power of song when it comes to something as catastrophic as addiction in families, and about what it means to him to be out there, to be on the road, to be live on the stage, to be creating music, now newly sober. So I hope you'll enjoy our podcast today. And as a reminder, please take a second to subscribe and rate our podcast if you enjoy the show, because only with your support can we continue to transform the way our country addresses addiction. Jeremiah, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. And congratulations on a fantastic, um, wow, and powerful, powerful um, record, this whole album. Uh, do we say still say album, by the way? I guess we don't. Yeah. Since nobody no, I mean, same. we, uh, when I say we, I mean, me and Wes, you know, we've, uh, this is Jeremiah. We, we write all the music together for the Lumineers, and we started the band about 15 years ago, and we still very much pride ourselves in the album or the LP, which is probably, mm -hmm. like you said, an antiquated term by now. But um, yeah, we're really proud of this album. I think we think uh, it's our best. It's pretty typical, I think, for people to think their newest is their best. But uh, we really truly do think that about this one. The entire album, called Three, is, uh, is a deeply personal and powerful look at the disease of addiction, told in three different uh, stories with three songs to each of those stories. Tell me about the decision to do this. You had said that you wanted to humanize the issue of addiction and you really do it. I mean, I, I'm reminded of somebody who said the question isn't what's wrong with you. The question is what happened to you. And you really explore that in this. Yeah. I mean, um, that's a great question. And it was a deep, it was a deeply personal album for, for me and Wes for different reasons. Uh, Wes Schultz is the singer and he writes all the lyrics and, you know, he actually, in his own way, his experience with addiction and experience with loving someone um, that's, that's been going through that and has been going through that. Um, it's someone in his, an extent in his extended family and he's seen it sort of ravage the the family and alcohol it's particularly alcoholism that has done that mm -hmm. and it's made that person homeless and it's made that person go into the er dozens if not hundreds of times literally um 
whether for overdoses or just blacking out or being, you know, completely drunk. And um, I think it, I think for him, it was this very cathartic way to deal with, you know, how do you, how do you deal with somebody in your family that you love and to watch them go through that? And for me, it brought up a lot of stuff because um, when I was, I think about 14 years old, my older brother, mm -hmm. Joshua, he was 19. He died of a heroin drug overdose. So when that happened, you know, that was the worst thing that's ever happened to me and my family. That was my parents first born. It was my only sibling, my, my older brother. And, you know, a lot of these lyrics and a lot of the, the songs about addiction, um, whether it's heroin, whether it's, you know, crack or alcohol or any addiction for that matter, um, it ravages the family and, you know, it, it really does terrible things. So there's a lot of crossover in people's experiences when, when talking about addiction and how people are affected by that. And, you call, uh, yeah. you, you likened it to the effect of a radiation bomb in a family. And I really actually thought that was, that was true. So yeah, Wes writes all the lyrics and Wes and his, uh, one of our buddies, this guy, Nick Bell, I think they sort of started to slowly develop this idea of three chapters and three different characters and sort of look at how intergenerationally addiction get passed on from mother, father to daughter, son, um, siblings, of course. And I think looking at that in that through that scope, again, like I said, really helped him deal with his, you know, deal with it in a cathartic way through music and through art, which I think is really healthy that we have that outlet and that we have that ability to, you know, to take those terrible feelings and take those terrible thoughts and actually put them into a, some sort of magical spiritual medium that is music. We know the numbers are unbelievably staggering. Um, there are tens of millions of people who are suffering from some sort of substance abuse disorder. Um, we know that one in three adults, however, believe that opioid addiction is a moral failing and that stigma present prevented 41% of people who need help from getting help. Are you guys hoping to humanize this um, by, by showing the stories, by showing the heartache, the heartbreak um, that inevitably sort of, you know, is it shot through any family with this issue? I think... I think less than some sort of moral soapbox, like don't do drugs. Cause I mean, that was told to all of us, particularly growing up in, in New Jersey, there was this program called the dare program. I don't know if that right. was right. Yeah. I don't know. No, I laughed because a lot of good that did. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's funny too. Funny in the, the dark, sad sense um, that where we grew up in uh, Bergen County in small town Ramsey, New Jersey, there was a lot of kids our age, a lot of peers, afflicted with opioid um, addiction. And when my brother died, um, it obviously felt like a tragedy and it was a tragedy. About 10, 15 years later, I, I heard the statistics and they were so staggering that it oddly gave me comfort in, in some weird twisted sense because there were so many people that had died from it. And mm -hmm. I don't know if comfort's the right word, but it was this, you know, just this feeling of like, oh, wow, I wasn't the only one. I felt connected to thousands, if not probably millions of other people that are all going through that or have gone through that. You were very close to your big brother growing up. Did you know he had the, uh, an, an issue this serious? I mean, how, when, how old were you when you realized that he's a real problem? I think that I realized that he had a real problem... I probably be about probably about nine nine months before he died, mm -hmm. and then only sad to say only when he died I really really realized um, I was so young you know I think I was I think it was two thousand one when he died I was born in eighty six so I think I was either fourteen or fifteen maybe having just turned fifteen when he died and I remember. He died, um, I think it was Sunday, May 27th, 2001. I think that was the date. I remember it was Memorial Day weekend. And I remember the last time that I had seen him prior to that was sometime in October. 
So, wow. you know, yeah, rewind from May 27th to probably early October. I was in high school in Ramsey. And I remember my mom, she woke me up for school and she said something like, honey, you know, sweetie, your brother was arrested last night. Um, he, he was driving, he was parked in a car at an A&P on the East Coast. There are these uh, grocery stores called A&P. Um, mm -hmm. And he was parked in an A&P um, parking lot. And I think it was like two or three in the morning and a police officer, you know, tapped on his window and I think said like, you know, what are you doing? And I think he said some of the effect of like, I'm going to go crash my car on the highway. And he was apparently high in PCP, I believe. And he had gone into the grocery store because he ran out of drugs. And I think he was high in PCP. And I think he had ingested some Drano, you know, the stuff you'd use to clean your sink uh, and toilets and whatever for the drains. Oh. Um, so he oh went to the, yeah, he went into the ICU somewhere in a hospital in New Jersey, um, I think with second and third degree burns on his throat and his esophagus. And, but I was so young, I, I knew, I didn't even know if I knew all the grisly details at that moment. I just knew he got arrested. And even months or year or years, I forget, before that, when he first got in trouble at the high school for weed, I remember I laughed because I was like, who gives a shit? It's just, I, even in my young age, I was like, it's just weed. I don't know what happened to him in, in between A and B. Something happened. Mm -hmm. And I remember me and him both played soccer growing up. And I remember he did something to his knee. He injured his knee and he got prescribed Percocet. And that was it. The Percocet he fell in love with. He saved them. He would abuse them. And that eventually led to heroin. So, you know, it's sort of a, it's a slow, I don't know. It's a slow burn. It's a slow step-by-step -step process to get from a to Z or a to step A to B. And, uh, yeah. Why hadn't you seen him since October? So I think in October he essentially got arrested, went into the hospital. I think he went into an inpatient rehab and then my parents, um, tried the tough love approach where they wanted to, I think they basically said no drugs in the house and, you know, you, or you can live with us as long as you're sober. I think it was something to that effect. And mm -hmm. he went to go live with his grand, our, our grand, my, gr or, yeah, our grandmother, he went to go live, live with. My grandmother was the one that found him on that day. She, you know, my poor granny, she's, she, she died, uh, I think four or five years ago. But um, she went through a lot discovering him and she went to church that morning and I think she came back around 11 or 12 and called up to him and thought he was sleeping. She went up there and, you know, touched his leg and it was cold as ice. And then she called our house and I remember I was the one that picked up the phone and I remember she was pretty hysterical and um, I remember I thought something was happening to her. I thought she was having a heart attack, to be honest, or something. Mm -hmm. I thought something mm -hmm. was... I thought she was in grave danger, nothing to do with my brother. Because in my youthfulness and my ignorance and my naivete or naive, naiveness, naivete, how the hell do you say that word? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> uh, in that state, I always told myself, may have even said it out loud once or twice, I always thought or told myself, this is something we'll laugh about at some point. Um, this is something that... And I don't know why I thought that. I just thought this is something we'll get over together. He'll get over it. I never thought to go see him because I never thought anything like that would happen. I don't think anybody expects it to happen, right. obviously. Um, you know, if this was happening now and, you know, I'm 34, if he was, I guess, 37 or 38, obviously I'd be much more involved and have a much greater understanding. But it's unfortunate. You know, you learn so much about addiction um, only after the fact. And then you have all these skills that are in vain or you have <laughs> you have all this knowledge that's in vain or something. And I really love this guy, uh, Gabor Mate. He's, I think he's a genius. Yeah. And he, yeah, he talks a lot about addiction and recovery. And I really think he has said some of the most profound stuff I've ever read on the, on the subject. And I love his simple, profound question of not why the addiction, but why the pain. You know, mm -hmm. I think he talks about like 
a deck of playing cards and cocaine that, you know, arguably or, you know, potentially there's nothing innately addictive about either, but someone can sit down and get heavily addicted to gambling and playing cards. Another person's, you know, can be a piece of cake, can be um, cocaine, it can be not, it can be alcohol, it can be this or that. So, um, yeah, not why the addiction, but why the pain. And I think that's really a really profound way to look at it. It's a very common thing. A lot of people in recovery talk about the fact that they used that substance, whatever it was, alcohol or drugs, um, to feel normal, to to finally feel comfortable and finally feel like you could live in that in your own skin. You know, yeah. that's a very, very common thing. You had said after his death that the grief was so intense and so immense and just relentless and just infinite. Um, I imagine it's something that lives with you forever, really. Yeah, it's something where it's something where it's about a million miles buried at all times, and it's also where it's like right underneath the skin. And, you know, you could be listening to a piece of music or watching a scene from a movie. And sometimes it's a scene from a movie that's not even related to brothers or something and just like can make me cry or, or think of him in a profound way. And then um, there's other times when talking to you right now, it feels um, like talkable or <laughs> it feels doable mm -hmm. to talk about it. And I think it used to feel more like anniversaries, whether his birthday or the anniversary of his death or the holidays were always very difficult. Now, one is not necessarily harder than the other. One isn't necessarily easier than the other. I just think as time passes on, um, I guess I'll be going on 20 years now coming up, mm -hmm. which is crazy. And uh, yeah, at the time it was terrible. And, you know, the first even 10 years, it really was constant. It felt like. And then um, it never really goes away. You can talk about it. You can figure out some things, some aspects about it. You can make it easier, better, digest it more, um, those types of things. But it never really goes away. Perhaps that's a good thing. You know, I love the idea that I just saw this uh, this show. It's a very dark show. It's called Mr. Mercedes. And it's a fantastic show. It's adapted from a Stephen King novel. And uh, I think... The psychotic killer in the show talks about this idea that you you die twice, and I'm sure that's from something else. Somebody else probably wrote that. Whether Stephen King wrote that, whoever, but this idea that uh, people die twice. Um, the first time you die, you know, literally your body stops and your brain shuts down, and then the second time is the last time someone mentions your name. And, mm. you know, the idea that we're triggered to remember terrible things so well, <laughs> unfortunately, for better or for worse, we remember these things so well. Um, perhaps that gives us reason to talk about these these people still. So that's, uh, I guess, a, a silver lining to it. It's interesting. Stephen King came up with that idea. He's in long time recovery himself. Yeah, I've read some pretty crazy stories about him, like waking up out of a stupor in his office, like paper strewn about and a, a bloody nose from doing so much cocaine and then beer bottles everywhere and you know it's it doesn't help when people like him and keith richards are so profound and so talented it doesn't help debunk the the culture that you know be me being an, a musician um mm -hmm. i just celebrated five years of sobriety <laughs> on, congratulations uh, thank you on august 27th um 27 seems to be a profound number in my life 27 was i think the day my brother died and then um 27 august and then mm -hmm. april 27th There's... my son's birthday wow so, yeah it's pretty wild um but you know stephen king being in recovery and keith richards probably not being in recovery but it doesn't help debunk the myth that people like that have inadvertently or advertently provided so many millions of people to look up to when you're 17, 18, 19, you're like, yeah, that guy does heroin, or he does Coke or he drinks and he, he's, you know, he's written all these novels or he's in the Rolling Stones. And I think that's bad for, uh, for kids and teenagers, even adults to sort of like 
oh, well, there's a correlation, you know, and there's so many amazing bands and people that have died um, directly or indirectly from drugs. I mean, the list is just so immense. You have, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison right. and John Bonham, the drummer of uh, Zeppelin, drank himself to death and Elvis and, you know, all these people. The list literally is, you know, Prince and Chris Cornell and the Lincoln Park singer Chester. So many people have committed suicide or died from heavy, heavy, heavy drug use. And I think that doesn't help debunk. And I think that's something that I think for me being sober, it's shown me that it's possible to be sober. I think it's shown me that it's possible still to be creative sober. I think that this album three is the best album I've ever been a part of musically and creatively. And mm -hmm. um, I did all that sober because five years ago I became sober. And in that time we wrote all the, all the music together. And, you know, my thing was alcohol. It was something that I think just from touring so much, we sort of toured ourselves into the ground. I think yeah, it became it's part of the culture, right? It's big time part of the culture. And I think yeah. it's, you know, it's fun and it's cool in the beginning. And then it just becomes tired. It's just so tired. And, you know, that, that classic, you're, what is it? Sick of being tired and tired of being sick and mm -hmm. sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, yeah. um, you know, it's really it rings true and it, it is true. And, when I first, you know, gave up alcohol, somebody told me you're going to feel so much more connected to music and you're going to love to be creative and you're going to be, it's going to be so much better. And I thought, what a load of bullshit. I really did not, um, <laughs> you know, I really didn't think that was going to be true. And now I, you know, only through tried and tested, like actually going through it, um, I feel like I've become more connected with music, more connected with my creativity. The culture, the glamorization of it. I mean, whether it's even back to Ernest Hemingway, sort of the image of the inebriated genius writing or creating, you know, while under the influence. Um, what what yeah. nobody else is writing about is when that inebriated genius wakes up the next morning shaky and nauseous and hungover. Yeah. Yeah. Charles Burkowski, he comes to mind too. And I mean, yeah. Charles Burkowski, he was a huge you know, still is, but it was a huge like influence on me too. I really loved his writing and I loved, yeah, the genius drunk and he's writing and he's smoking and you know, this or that. And, um, yeah, nobody talks about the, the next morning. It's true. Right. You mentioned you were sick and tired of being sick and tired. Why exactly did you decide to get sober five years ago? I think for me, I realized, so I guess I was, I don't know how, I guess if I'm 34, I guess I was 29. I probably realized around 27 that I should probably stop or try to limit it. Mm -hmm. And then between 27 and 29, I tried to limit it. And I never drank in the morning. It wasn't, you know, I was very functional. And I don't even know if I would necessarily even call myself an alcoholic. But I was very, you know, functional in what I could do. I could perform. I could be a husband, uh, wasn't like stealing money or doing absurd things. And I think in my mind, I was like, well, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just, you know, mostly I'm, oh, I'm on tour and this helps me go to sleep or this helps me escape the harsh realities of touring for three and a half years straight, essentially on the first album and things like that. So probably around 27, I realized, and then 29, um, I just remember I, I, you know, woke up one day and it was like probably the little voice inside my head for two years. Um, had a conversation with my wife, I remember. We were actually in the studio, believe it or not, making our second album called Cleopatra. We were making it in New York State. Mm -hmm. And I called my wife and she just asked me, how are you doing? And then I probably lied and said, I'm fine. And then, you know, she probably said, like, how are you doing again? And when are you... <laughs> Typically, when you ask someone how they're doing the second time, you get the real answer. And uh, I think it all just kind of spilled out. Like, I think I just said, I'm, I'm sick of this. I'm not really, you know, I'm sorry. This is probably a lot to take. But, you know, I feel like I do have a bit of a, I don't know. Yeah, a problem. I want to I want to stop this. And it was a really, really difficult time for sure. 
it was a terrible time to to come to grips with that and i think that you know just to give it up cold turkey i had no withdrawal symptoms if that gives any indication of like how much i was drinking it wasn't like i was shaking or saw had night sweats or you know hallucinations or anything like that but um yeah, I think it was almost easy the first even three months or six months. And then, you know, as time where time went on, it became difficult. But then there's just little subtle, sometimes it's gigantic shifts in what you do. And sometimes it's subtle shifts. I mean, maybe a gigantic slash subtle shift was just like leaving places earlier, maybe leaving the bar, still being able to go to bar, but maybe leaving at 945 instead of 145, you know, and just realizing like nothing productive or good has ever happened between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. ever in like the history of mankind, you know, <laughs> unless you're jet lagged. Like if you're doing like anything between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. and st still awake, it's probably something not good. And I think, you know, being married and wanting to have a family and all that, I think it was just you know, to get my shit together, especially before having our beautiful son, um, who's now two and a half, it's like, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm really thankful that that was my path. I think it shows you too, that, you know, maybe someone's listening to this right now and thinking, wow, what an asshole, you know, this guy's older brother died of drugs and he still had the tenacity or the arrogance or the boldness to, uh, to, to drink. And I've thought about that myself. And I think that kind of shows you the power of, I don't know. You can you can still witness something so terrible in your own family and still be drawn to this to this thing inadvertently. It's you never wake up one day and you're like, I want to fuck up my life. I want to, you know, I want I want to wake up in ten years and feel miserable every day. Um, nobody ever consciously says that. So I think what we're talking about is really powerful and how profound um, addiction and you know what it can do to someone's brain. So. No, I, I, you know, I wrote a book about my recovery and I, I wrote in the book, no little girl ever lies awake in bed and says, when I grow up, I want to be an alcoholic. And no woman wakes up in the morning and says, today's a great day to go get drink myself unconscious and have to go to the emergency room. Nobody plans to do this. Can um, I ask, was that your, uh, was that your drug or drink of choice? It was alcohol? Alcohol was my, yeah, yeah it, was, it was alcohol. Um, and I didn't start drinking until later in life. You know, it all, it, it, this disease takes many paths. I really didn't start drinking until I was in my twenties mm. and in television news, it's another industry where there's a lot of high, you know, high pressure, live TV, everybody troops to the bar afterwards. It's sort of everybody drinks and, uh, um, sure. yeah, nobody's ever like, yeah, do you want a glass of water with lemon or do you want a salad yeah. or I don't know, like yeah. do you want some fresh squeezed juice? It's never, uh. Yeah, it's just so part of the culture and it doesn't, it's not just music. And it's, it's funny. I mean, it's also on the job drinking, you know, at least for musicians, it's like if you were a teacher and you were drinking, you would be fired and ousted from the community and it'd be like, you know, canceled all over social mm -hmm. media. Um, musicians drinking or using drugs while like actually literally during the work, it's, it's fine. It's whatever. It's actually, you know, it's part of it. And um, yeah, it's dangerous. And then at the end, it's just kind of boring. That's how I, I kind of feel. I don't, I don't feel like I'm on some sort of pedestal ever. I never have. And I don't think I ever will, but I think just for me, um, yeah, I don't know. It just shifted a, a big shift for me in my thinking. I was struck by the lyrics to the song Gloria from this album, Gloria, I smell it on your breath, Gloria, booze and peppermint, Gloria, no one said enough is enough. Gloria, they found you on the floor. Gloria, my hand was tied to yours. Gloria, did you finally see that enough is enough? That was really, I really connected with that. I think that, um, you know, that's one of Wes's great talents is that I think the peppermint was the key for me. I think, you know, yeah. when you're talking about addiction, I think when you're talking about love when you're talking about a big open-ended um grand subject you almost have to find something specific to tease out the humanity i think 
And I think when he said the peppermint um, on the breath, it just, it was like this really random lyric that I wasn't even, I was sort of like, okay, it's cool. Like peppermint, it's not really like a musical word, peppermint. But then, yeah, it just really grew on me. And I thought, wow, what a what a cool novel idea to like, to, to use that in the words. And I think that. Well, it shows her effort to disguise it. She's yeah, eating peppermint so that nobody will smell the alcohol. And it's like, it yeah, work. like this minuscule aspect, almost like a pixel, a part of a larger frame that, how do you talk about something so big? Well, you pick some random minuscule aspect of it and you tease that out and then, yeah, masking the breath, peppermint. It doesn't have to be like, you're a drunk and you're always in rehab and, you know, these, you know, heavy handed uh, lyrics or something. It's so, it was oddly beautiful in that regard. And I think that, when I remember when we first, when we were writing this album together, um, he kept coming in with lyrics akin to that. You know, there's two songs in the album that are heavily about this person. Gloria is one, obviously, and the second is Leader of the Landslide. Um, Leader of the Landslide might be one of my favorite songs that we've ever written together. And again, it's very mm -hmm. much heavily about um, this person. And, and then... I brought the music into the song called Donna and I brought in a couple lyrics and showed him and, um, you know, he has an another lyric in Donna, like you couldn't sober up enough to hold the baby. And I was thinking like, Oh man, like this whole album is so heavy. <laughs> like <laughs> it's all about this person and drinking. And, um, you know, I remember saying to him, I said, I think we should, can we just like take a walk around the block? You know, can we take a walk? And, um, I was like, I think it's, I think it's important to sing about this stuff, but it was definitely a moment where I, th I said to him, you know, this is bringing up a lot of, a lot of stuff for me too. This is bringing up a lot of shit, like trudging up the past and bringing up a lot of memories that I thought were dormant or even extinct in my own family and in my own, uh, you know, relationship with it. So, um, it was a really great heart to heart, very candid conversation to have about that because, you know, it was just, it wasn't like, hey, don't sing about this stuff either. I just need you to know that this is what's going on with me with it. And, um, you know, when we when we finished the album and uh, Kevin Phillips, the amazing director that did all the music videos, he did, you know, he had a, he had the tall task of doing all the music videos so that they weaved into each other. But also if you saw one as a standalone, it would still sort of make sense or be the, be like powerful and poetic in its own its own uh, regard and um the gloria video is very intense if anybody hasn't seen it i would suggest checking it out if they like the song it's very the whole thing is intense the whole yeah. um they're all and i think you know what what's so powerful about them is you see and hear hear through the music and see through the series of music videos which together form what a 40 minute mini movie in mm, essence yeah. you really see what you referred to and we were talking about at the beginning of this interview that how much it's like a, a nuclear bomb in a family yeah how it ripples out and affects everybody not just that night or that week but that year and that gener you know that decade <laughs> that generation and how it's passed down. It's such a profound tragedy what this disease does to families. And you have written about it and you show it so beautifully in these songs and yes, in those videos that were made to, to form this sort of mini movie. Yeah, I mean, I watched uh, the, the the mini series Chernobyl on HBO and just- Yeah, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah, it was so stunning and sad and- um, really profound in a you know awesome in the sense of catastrophically terrible how like the awesome power of what uranium or the, the radiation would do to the community and stuff and it just was so and yeah i guess similarly with addiction it just really seems to ring true in that same regard well and in chernobyl that entire you know hundreds of square miles if not thousands of square miles are, are sealed off and shut down. Like the, the ground has been poisoned. Yeah. The air has been poisoned. The trees, everything that lives there the water. has been poisoned. Yeah. And, and I mean, poisoned might be the wrong word to use when it comes to addiction, but impacted most certainly. Yeah. No, it's true.
you know, we used you know, the song Salt and Sea for our um, partnership to end addiction, our campaign. Uh, thank you, first of all. It, it's an incredible campaign and your song really makes it. Oh, thanks. Um, it's super cool I to love... see it put to the animation and stuff. It was really just... Yeah. And it's all about connection, which is the key to to fighting the disease of addiction. Um, and I'm struck by the refrain in the song, all that you suffered, all the disease, you couldn't hide it, hide it from me. Somebody always does see. I mean, no matter how much we, you know, in the grips of the disease may try and hide it or keep it a secret, it leaks no, it's, out. It's true. And uh, I think that potentially it leaks out or it seeps out in these different ways because I think the person suffering wants to be found, wants to be heard, wants to be discovered. I think even deep down, if they don't think they want to, or they say out right out loud that they don't want to, I think deep down they, they want to be discovered, have the secret. Um, like I alluded to before when I was 27, I think there was a part of me that thought, well, somebody's just probably going to like almost make this decision for me. And I remember, um, it was funny when I was to stop drinking that is when I was probably 17, 18, 19, I looked up to people that, or I was in, I don't know what the right word is or phrase and influence inspired by, you know, falling again, 17, 18, 19 years old, falling into that trap of being like the glamorization of drinking and, and drug use. And then, um, it sort of flipped where, when I started to become sober, it was looking to the opposite where, you know, even the actor Bradley Cooper, I remember, I think he became sober at the same time at 29. And he said something, something to the effect of, I think I've had enough beer, you know, for a lifetime. And I was like, wow, I feel the same exact way. But I just needed a couple more years to like, you make know, sure. <laughs> yeah. Just to be like, am I sure? You know, and sort of wrestle with it and try to, oh, what's that word? Like bargain, a lot of bargaining, mm. as I'm sure, you know, and yeah, a lot of bargaining being like, well, and I remember even in that two year period, like not drinking for a month and then being like, oh, that was easy. I'll not drink for two months. And then coming back with a vengeance, you know, just these little things that um, when you look back, you're like, there's not enough bargaining in the world. Do you think by writing these songs, making this album, doing this tour, hopefully starting back up when the pandemic finally ends, um, do you think that you're encouraging people to not just address it perhaps in their own lives, um, but helping chip away at that stigma? Because I know you were talking about the whole, you know, how you felt hearing about other people who had lost a sibling to drug addiction and how your reaction was, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not the mm. only person carrying this excruciating burden of grief. Do you think that by writing these songs and and making this album and doing this tour and making this incredible like movie of music videos that 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 go along with it, that you're not only going to help people feel less alone, but perhaps chip away a tiny bit at the stigma because we know we're not alone. I I mean, I think that's a, those are great points. I, I think, I hope so. I think that ultimately you make something and I've heard Wes say this and I think it's really wise. I think like the idea that you're not so much prescribing something, but you're describing something. I think in, you know, through his lyrics of describing these situations in the way that people, and then through my own personal story of kind of, revealing intimate details of my own sobriety and the intimacy of like, you know, coming to grips with being a, a sober artist that can still be prolific and still create and stuff. Yeah, I hope so. I, I don't think I consciously think, well, I'm going to tell my story. So X, Y, and Z happened, but the mm -hmm. way you just phrased it was, was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> was, was healthy. You know, it was like a, a noble, um, a noble cause, a noble endeavor. I think that, Maybe somebody that's 15 or 19 or even 24, maybe they, you know, hear this and hear me talk about it and maybe they're on the verge of going through, you know, maybe I can, or maybe anybody, any of us can save, you know, 10 years of sadness and help them skip a few steps and not have to go down. Because, you know, for me, it probably just took that extra two years where I was like, well, uh, let me see. Maybe it's, maybe I am, you know, maybe I, I'm fine. And, uh, 
you know, two years. I could have had two years back and started two years, had seven years of sobriety instead of five. But it's easier said than done. So, yeah, I think if something good, long story short, if something good comes from from all this for, for other people, um, and some of those connections, you know, you'll never actually see, you'll never actually meet. But um, I realized, I think a light bulb went off in my head where I realized a lot of my favorite artists or it's like they open up the pages of their diary, even like someone like the Red Hat Chili Peppers. I mean, they're just so open about their heroin drug addictions and they lost a band member and they lost so much and they gained so much through their storytelling and gained so much through their brutal honesty. Um, I think that's really beautiful and that is inspiring more so than the drunk writer at midnight smoking and waking up shaking the next morning. So. Well, no, it's, it's like that line booze and peppermint, you know, <clears throat> in those three words, you realize that is written by somebody who has been there because that I know exactly what that's about. It's about drinking secret drinking and, and futilely trying to cover it up. Um, and immediately followed with that is the realization somebody else has been in that exact position and I'm not alone. And that's the key is sometimes that's the first step in recovery, whether it's for the person who's, you know, using drugs or alcohol in an unhealthy way or the people around them who are affected by that issue to realize you're not alone. And then you can take that next step perhaps and ask for help. And that's, you know, that's the key. That's no, the key. it's true. It's true. So, well, thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. Thank you for showing everybody that you can be sober and be super cool because <laughs> you are. <laughs> oh, thanks. No, thanks a lot. It means a lot. And uh, yeah, anytime we get to talk about this sort of thing, it's it's not uh, always easy just to like, um, you know, open up about it, but you're easy to talk to about it. So thanks for, for being like that. And um, yeah, I don't know. This is... Uh, not something we always get to do. So it's super cool for me. A lot of the questions are typically about specifically about the songs or about an upcoming tour or promoting something that we're doing. And um, yeah, so thank you for that. Well, thank you. We really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you when the pandemic lifts back on that stage in those arenas. So, yeah. Thanks a lot. All right. All right. Take care. Thanks, Jeremiah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to our talk with Jeremiah today. His new solo album, Piano Piano, is available now, and I encourage you to listen to it when you can. And you can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. As a reminder, if you need help with a loved one who's struggling with substance use, you can text 55753 or visit drugfree.org. And we'll talk to you soon.